Okay, some music. We are live. What's up, Nick? What up, Mike? How's it going? Good, good, man. Um, we'll see who else joins us today. But again, welcome, everybody. This is our first... Oh, let me look at the camera. This is our first live streaming on YouTube, which is awesome. Because uh, we're going to talk about wedding gear today. But I'm just we're just waiting for a few more people to hop on. If it's just us two, it's all good, too. Um, but let's just kind of introduce ourselves really quick. So again, my name is my name is Mikey. Um, I'm a Southern California wedding photographer um, based out of Riverside, California. I've been shooting weddings for over seven years now. If you want to follow me, my Instagram handle is at photos by Mikey. And then uh, how about you, Nick? Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicholas. I, too, am a Southern California wedding photographer. I've been located in Riverside, California. I've been shooting weddings and portraits uh, a little over three years now. And if you want to find me on Instagram, my Instagram is at pho photo G Nicholas. That's P-H-O-T-O-G-N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S. And I guess I could have put that in the name thing like you did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know if you can still change it, but. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. I don't okay, right we could do that later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So today we're going to talk about talk all about wedding photography gear. Um, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but I think a good way to, to kind of start this live podcast is to kind of talk about like again, the essentials on what exactly you need as a wedding photographer to get started. So let me kind of give you guys my my opinion on this because there's so many different ways you can go about, you know, getting gear, what kind of gear you need to buy and things like that. So my first opinion on this, and I know Nick can agree on this, is if you don't have a lot of money in the beginning, it's to just buy used gear. Um, oh, there he is. Mr. Brent. Brent. Oh, you're probably on mute, Brent. Mute, Brent. Brent, Brent, what up, bro? up? Can you hear us? Yeah, sorry. I just had to switch my Bluetooth over. I'm okay, here. Cool. What's awesome, going on? Brother. Good morning. Good morning. I hear the, I hear the kid uh, screaming in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Dad. <laughs> yep. That's right. uh, it's all good, but uh, actually, Brent, like, um, give us a quick intro, um, where you're based out of, what do you do, and then maybe your Instagram handle. Um, my name's Brent Sacona. I'm a wedding photographer in Southern California. Um, my Instagram handle is Brent Sacona. Awesome, perfect, yeah. man. Um, so yeah, so this live stream is basically all about wedding photography gear. And so um, I was just telling Nick, like for a lot of people that are starting out as a wedding photographer, you know, they can start out just buying used gear. Um, you know, you can go on OfferUp, Facebook Marketplace. I mean, you can even hit up like Facebook, Facebook groups and sometimes people sell their used gear. But that's like a, a, a good way to start because a lot of the gear I, we find now, like even the past two years, a lot of people like, want to upgrade so mm -hmm. because canon and sony they put out like a new camera body like every two months so um so what's your thoughts on that nick yeah i agree i used the way to go and if if you want to get in right away rent renting is renting is a good way uh find out what kind of gear you maybe want to get into or what kind of system you're looking in uh getting into such as Sony, Canon, Nikon, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I believe uh, renting and buying used. How about you, Brent? I'm all for buying everything brand new on a credit card all at once. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, you got to do what you got to do, you know, whether that's renting or borrowing or um, buying used. Um, whatever works, but you just got to do something to get out there. Yeah, so exactly. whatever, wherever you are financially, you just make it work. Yeah, exactly. I, I think also renting is also a good option too. Cause when I first started, I mean, I only had one camera body and then like maybe one lens. So, um, there was a, luckily there was like a lo local shop in Pomona called give them a shout out, IE photo rentals. Um, cause it's, you know, it's a good way to just also try out gear too. So if you guys are kind of like not super like 
you know, sure about buying a certain lens, you can try them out, you know, rent it out. Because some of these lenses are well over $2,000 sometimes. So you don't want to spend all that money and then figure out you don't like that lens, right? Totally. Yeah, I, I recommend renting everything or at least using it, whether it's renting or borrowing before you buy anything. Because yep. all these people have different opinions about what is the best lens for wedding photography, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that it that it is. So everybody exactly. styles different and it makes sense to try things out before you commit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, let's start, with, let's start with these questions really quick. So, Brent, what was your very first camera setup when you first shot your own wedding? Um, well, at the time of my first wedding, I had a Canon 7D. And um, I had done enough research to know that I shouldn't go into a wedding with um, a single card slot camera. <laughs> and uh and a crop sensor camera so i i went on borrow lenses and i rented a canon 5d i think it was a mark three or a mark four at the time i'm not sure um and used that as my main camera and pushed my 7d to my to my second body and that worked out it worked out great and it was um i felt safe knowing that i was using a full frame with a dual card slot setup. absolutely how about you nick I knew about going in with two cameras and uh, <laughs> I went in with one. <laughs> I actually went in, I got a uh, Sony a7 III with a Sigma 24 to 70. And I bought a uh, Godox V862 as my on-camera flash. And that's how I covered the entire wedding. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yep. Whatever works, right? Um, I think my first, yeah, my first wedding... I had an old school Canon 5D Mark II. And for people that don't know, that's one of the first like DSLRs that had 1080p video on it. Um, and I think the megapixel on that is like maybe 20 or something, something around that you know range. And I just had, I think I just, my very first pro lens, I had the 50 mil, the 1.2. And then that, that was it. So, but I ended up running, uh, another camera body at IE photo rentals. And then I ended, I think rented like a, uh, this 24, one Oh five just as like a backup. Um, and then like a basic flash, but yeah, that was like, that was like the basics I had. I had nothing else. Right. I didn't re realize like <clears throat> that, um, like something longer too, cause it was a church ceremony. So a Catholic ceremony. So I know we, you all know that sometimes some of these churches are like very restricted and for, for you just to shoot with like a, even like with a 50 is still kind of far if you want to get tight shots. Um, but, but yeah, that's why I kind of prefer the 7200 when I'm doing like ceremonies. Um, but yeah, those were like super old school camera bodies. Now it's insane what the technology is now. Right. I mean, even with like, look at Sony's like, dynamic range um even the canon the mirrorless has just changed the game right um the quality the sound like uh, sound of the shutter i mean there's literally no like you barely hear it right um and so so what do you let me only oh, i'm ask uh, let me ask nick so what's your current setup now nick i actually have two sony a7-3s now and i'm shooting all on primes uh so i have a uh, 24 millimeter 1.8 a 35 uh, 1.4 and an 85 1.8 and um i'm i was just telling mikey the other day that uh i'm going to be getting into a uh the tamron 28 to 75 so i'm going to give that give that lens a try uh, i'm going to rent it actually first okay. see how i like it yeah uh but yeah, and then as far as lighting goes, I have two uh, Godox V1s. I have two 8200s and the, uh, the Godox 8600. Sweet, man. Um, what's like your go-to lens? Like if you just had to use one lens, like what's, what's that lens that you prefer? Uh, 24 to 70. <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as primes go, if I had yeah. one lens and that's all I had to shoot, uh, uh a 35 millimeter or a 50 millimeter uh i don't i don't have my 50 anymore uh just because i have my 35 and my 85 but uh 50 could 
pretty much get you done the whole wedding. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How about you, Brent? Canon R6 is what I like to use. I've used R5, and I just prefer the R6 because of the SD card slots, having all my cards be one type of card instead of mixing it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I like those. And then Canon 35, um, 15 to 35, 70 to 200. Those are like, that's like my my combo that I, I like to use. 35 would be my go-to also for the majority of the day if I had to use one. Absolutely. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think a 35 or a, or a 50, I think sometimes 50s, it could get kind of tight maybe in the reception area, right? Uh, you may have to back up a lot, but, but yeah, like a 35 or a 24 to 70, if you just had one lens, even a 24 to 105, I'd say like one of those, like, you know, an F4, cause they're a lot, like sometimes half the price than like a 24 to 70, 2.8. Um, they're going to save you more money, but the only downside to that is the aperture is, you know, at F4. So you're not getting enough light. If you're trying to shoot like a, a Catholic ceremony indoors, you're going to have to crank up that ISO a lot. Um, but I do find like if, if there's a lot of space, a 50, just it's amazing. Right. I mean, cause a lot of the 50 primes out there, they're like 1.8 or a 1.2. I mean, you can shoot ceremony and reception because it's going to give you enough light um, to get through the just entire day. I just remembered. I'm also renting the, uh, that Tamron, 35 to 150 the f2 to 2.8 i'm gonna give that one a try too oh no. nice See. yeah don't you have a 24 i do i have a samyang 24 1.8 oh okay and yeah that that lens definitely comes in clutch when there's a big group and there's not very much room some of these venues can be pretty pretty tight with a lot right. and they'll fit a lot of people in there uh but i sell seldom do i use it i will use it for like dance floor stuff you know, getting in a little tight. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, how about your um, SD cards? I know a lot of people ask me about this, like SD cards, like what type of SD cards do you guys prefer? Or, you know, what size would you prefer? Like, what do you guys think about that? Go ahead, Brent. <laughs> um, I use a SanDisk um, 128 for... Um, for all my SD cards and knock on wood. I don't even know if I should say anything. They've been good so far. <laughs> <laughs> no problems. Oh, really quick. We got Theo Tran in the house. Hello. hello. What's up, Theo? Good morning, Theo. What's up, morning, Theo? morning. So this, this is our first YouTube live stream. So really quick, could you give yourself a quick intro? What do you do? Where you're from and your Instagram handle? Yeah, so my name is Theo Tran. I'm from Moreno Valley, California in the Inland Empire. Uh, I'm 23 years old. I'm a wedding photographer since 2021. And uh, yeah, I do weddings, engagements, portraits, all that kind of stuff. Um, my wedding handle is at Theo, I mean, wedding Instagram handle is at Theo Tran Photos on Instagram. Awesome. Cool, man. Yeah, but we were just talking about like SD cards. Um, I use the Ritz. If you guys, <laughs> you guys ever heard of, heard of the Ritz? <laughs> Those yeah. Ritz Carlton. My, my yeah. goes to Zales and buys his SD cards. <laughs> <laughs> Those are actually they're super cheap. I think if you go on Amazon, they're like for a one twenty eight, they're like thirty dollars or something like that. Oh, that's a real that's a real brand. The Ritz. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Ritz. <laughs> no, you're making a joke. <laughs> yeah. Go to Amazon and type in Ritz. Uh, Ritz gear or something yeah. like that yeah those are some of the cheapest and there's a new one that's like angel bird you guys have heard of angel bird mm -mm. okay yeah they're kind of more popular on the like cf express um because they're like half the price than like sandisk um but if you had to ask me i do use mostly sandisk um uh, i prefer a 128 for doing like a an eight hour wedding day if you're doing like maybe like a small wedding, you know, you're by yourself, a 64 you can kind of get away with, you know, um, unless you have like a, a Canon R5 or, you know, a Sony 7.4. I mean, those files are massive. So you might want to think about, um, 
you know, compressing those files, right? So, like, like Theo, you use a, a four, right? A Sony. Yeah, Sony A7 IV. Yeah. What's the size yeah. on that megapixel? Uh, the raw files are it's thirty three megapixels, I believe. So each each raw picture is thirty three megabytes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's the yeah. Sony A7 R4 that sixty two megapixels. The R4. Yeah, the R4. I used gotcha. to have that. Man. Oh, you yeah. did you? Yeah, and shooting um, uncompressed, the files were like 128 megabytes each. It was <laughs> Holy nuts. smokes. Yeah. Wow. I actually had, I had, uh, I, I was shooting on an R4, and then I ended up selling it, got, went backward, cut an A7, another A7 III, <laughs> and just bought another leg. Yeah, yeah, I did the same thing. Sold my A7R4 to go to the A7IV. Wow, wow. Um, what, what do you guys think about, like, actually compressing because i know most cameras can compress right your 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 raw files what's your thoughts on like the the quality when you guys do that unless you're shooting landscape or like something like a big uh uh like say fashion shoot or something like that where they're going to be blown up really big like really really big there's I've noticed no difference, uh, even in the dynamic range, at least on the Sony's, uh, it's not, it cuts your file size in half and there's just as much dynamic range, just as much, uh, room to, to edit. So I think it's, I think it's great. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, cause I do compress, even if I shoot R6, sometimes I've sh shot compressed and it doesn't really make a big difference unless unless you're doing like something that's like an epic photo that you want to print, like, you know, a large print, maybe okay. just uncompress it really quick. It takes like two seconds, but I actually don't really see a, a huge difference. Maybe when I shoot reception, if I do compress, like maybe a little bit of quality, quality uh, degrade, but not r that much. It's like very little and it saves you so much um space right for storing all these raw files like if i don't know if you can see behind me hold on let me take this out so these are eight terabyte hard drives and and then i have like um hold on let me take this out And I have these uh, Western Digital. So I have a ton of external hard drives just because, I mean, over the years, I prefer not to delete my raw files just because if I need to go back. Um, I know a lot of people have different opinion on, opinions on that. Um, but eventually, like, hard drives are also essential. If you start doing weddings, you're going to need backups on backups. So what I figured out, in my, in my opinion, is that <clears throat> these are great. The, I believe these are, like, two terabytes. Um, but over the years, I was like, you know what, let me just buy a bigger one just because it's easier. I don't have, you know, all these mini ones and I can just buy three at a time and just sync it up. Um, and, and it's a little bit faster. Um, so, so let me ask you guys how you guys back up your, your raw photos. Let's start with, uh, start with Theo. Yeah. So I back up. Once I get home, I back up everything to two separate. Um, I actually have some right here. There's these uh, Lacey Mini drives. Oh, nice. Yeah, each one's four terabytes. So I back it up to two of those, and then I just back it up to, to the cloud. And that's pretty much it. And I just keep the raw photos for a year, and then it all goes away because I don't, I don't have the same um system as you where i keep it just in case uh, i usually don't end up needing it so i just after a year it's in the contract the clients know that i just won't have the raw photos anymore right right yeah. how about you brent um, i also back up onto lacy minis um, i upgraded to a when i got a new macbook pro a few months back i got a um i got a four terabyte okay so i put everything for the year on my um, computer and I edit from there now instead of having to be connected to a Lacey disc and I back up on the two Lacey's and then I'm starting to use Rosy for my raw files that are ancient. Uh, yeah. I, so, yeah. So with Rosy, let me ask you this. So with Rosy, like when you compress the files, are you able to compress like 
like there's no un there's no amount that you can compress like let's say i have a four a folder with four gigabytes like you can compress that entire folder um yeah and their claim is that you can compress up to 80 percent of the data without losing anything oh, so wow. you bring those files back and they're just completely usable editable like like they were before you compress them oh nice and i've also been hearing a lot about backblaze as a good place to uh put all your stuff i think it's like seven bucks a month or something and it's like a ridiculous amount of space oh nice okay i'll be you nick yeah let's go <clears throat> i i have a bunch of those uh sand disk uh, ssd two terabyte uh drives external hard drives i don't have any with me um they're in my other room <laughs> but uh i when i get home i typically will uh, immediately back all my file all the raws to both of them and um and then on uh one of them i also that's what i used to edit off of in lightroom and in photoshop and i'll keep those on there until i deliver uh the uh, all the edited jpegs to my clients and then i'll typically uh I'll transfer everything onto my other external. Actually, I just bought a four gigabyte, uh, or I think gigabyte, a uh, terabyte uh, SanDisk SSD. And that's the one I'm, I use to like back up my year. And I usually will back everything up, even the light, what like my uh, my Lightroom calling that I did. Mm -hmm. And I'll have, have it all backed up, my catalog. And then I'll <clears throat> usually clear it off of the other, the other SSD and, um, and yeah, I, I'm like you, Mike, I, I have a bunch of SSDs. I, I keep, I back everything up just in case. And maybe sometimes I'll go back and do a different type of edit, post them up. Um, or um, yeah, just kind of go back, see stuff that I may have missed then, do a re-edit, maybe even contact the client, let them know, hey, I did a, a re-edit on a photo, you know, tell me what you think, you know, and it kind of you know, kind of late, they get a chance to go back and relive that moment and maybe they, you know, want that photo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's talk about like, um, you know, how we deliver photos too. Cause I think that's also important because I know back in the day I used to just give the client access to my Google drive <laughs> or the Google photos. And it was just like, you know, yeah, yeah. when you're trying to deliver a thousand photos, it's like, it's too much to like handle. It's just not organized, right? It's just not clean. Um, so, I mean, I've been using Pixie set. I mean, there's a, other websites like you have, uh, what's another one that I was, I'm thinking out of my head right now. Shoot um, proof. Shoot proof. Um, yeah. I know George uses, uh, oh my God, I can't think. Um, there's like three or four other ones, but they just makes things a lot cleaner for the client experience. Right. When they, when you send them the link, I mean, it's super nice. Like it's like a, it's like a gallery, right? can create tabs where they they can click through different uh, times of the wedding day like the getting ready the wedding um ceremony stuff like that and then the cool thing i really like when i deliver those is that you can create custom like like ta like custom tabs and create like a highlight tab so it's like mm -hmm. the best of the best right that you want to show and just wow your clients um so what what, what do you use theo for your uh yeah, so I used to do the same as you, actually, with Google Drive, and I would just share it with them. But it was taking up so much space, and it was um, so slow and not easy to access for the clients and for myself as well. So I ended up switching over to Pixie Set as well and just making customized galleries and making it look pretty for the clients. Nice. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Brett? I use Pixie Set also. Yeah. I used to use Dropbox um, oh, man. back in the day and then um, stumbled upon Pixie Set, realized that's how people want to view their photos, not file by file. Um, they want to view them in an album. So I use that. And my clients use the favorites folders to, um, to help me figure out what they want to have in their albums that I make for them. Oh, nice. So those yeah. are really handy too because – then I just, I see what their favorites are and I sort of incorporate those into my favorites. Awesome. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Yeah, I, I too use Pixie Set now and um, it's it's awesome. In the beginning, I was doing prints and USBs and then 
and then I went to Google, Google Drive, uh, Google Photos. And then from there, I then uh, also used Dropbox. And I think it was you, Mike, that told me about Pixie Set in, in 2020. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I yeah, all my clients, they love it. They love how easy, seamless it is and easy to use the different folders and stuff to break down the day, put, have their engagement in one one folder and then um, break down of the day, or they can just view them all favorite, like what Brent said, and then also order prints or albums off of the site itself. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, it's just, you know, if you're trying to level up your, your uh, ability to create a, a great experience, like everything you do has to kind of circle around that, right? Everything from like the consultation to the delivery of images, I think is really important. Um, and so let's, let's circle back again to like when we first started, um, with wedding gear, like what was some of like your biggest obstacles or maybe challenges that you guys had with gear? I think in the beginning, um, was it more like just learning the gear or was it that you're like, you wanted the best gear, but you didn't have the money at the time or was it like lighting? Like, let's start with, uh, let's start with Brent. Um, what was like your biggest challenge, I think, when you first started, Brent, with, uh, with gear? Um, I think the biggest challenge was just cost to do business. <laughs> For me, I had this, this uh, I kept telling myself this story that I had to have certain gear to make good photos and um, that there was like a professional level you had to have your gear at. And so I just sort of always told myself that. And I think it became more of like a non-realistic frustration that I didn't really need to have, you know? Um, so the cost of gear probably was the biggest for me. Gotcha. How about you, Thea? Yeah, similar as well. And uh, that same thought process is what I had too, where um, like I got to a point where I was shooting almost only on primes, but 1.8 just wasn't good enough for me for some reason. Like, <laughs> It had to be 1.4 or the gear wasn't professional to use during a wedding day, you know? So I went through this dilemma of like selling gear, selling multiple lenses to buy one 1 1.4 lens and like making sure I got the highest end gear. And it was Nikon, by the way, so it wasn't even that much, but ended up selling that all and going to to Sony. So I think the hardest thing was just just budgeting for what I need for a wedding day. Absolutely. How about you, Nick? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All the same. <laughs> uh, gear. Uh, got it. Got into being a gearhead for a little bit, and uh, got that gas, and uh, uh, tried to focus more on gear than the business and the business aspect itself, and uh, how to run a business. And I was so focused on the gear, I was losing sight of that, and I was going out trying to remember you know what poses to do to do and all that stuff because i was so excited to use my my brand new flash with my big modifier or to use my new 24 to 70 lens and and not even you know learning about that within itself what like you know how to utilize the the actual zoom you know capabilities of the lens instead of just oh if it's tight i'm just gonna zoom real far out or zoom real far in kind of thing so yeah i think that's a good point i think a lot of people like they get into photography right like because of the gear sometimes like they they buy the latest and greatest you know camera body and the lenses and they don't really focus on the training and education or the skill side right so they're just too focused on like oh this is awesome, like this gear, like, but they don't really use it to its fullest co capability. And especially when you go on like a photo shoot, it's like, you kind of forget about like the posing, you forget about like, you know, the lighting conditions, you're just focused on like, what can this camera do, which is great, like, because camera gear is amazing. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of maybe new photographers struggle with, I think it's like, okay, you can work with it, whatever you have right now, and you can still make great photos because i remember i wish george was on this um live because he was one of the first photographers i've met um we actually met through work and he had the canon 
I think T3. So if you guys know what a Canon T3 is, that's like super consumer. You could buy, you could, I, th I think at the time, I think you could buy it at Walmart, Costco. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was like 500, maybe like around $400, right? Mm -hmm. But with George, he's very artistic. So the gear didn't even matter because he still put out amazing work. And at the end of the day, your client's not really going to care um, what, what camera you shot like this photo with, right? They don't really care about that at the end of the day. Um, there is one time though, I was like, cause I did have a, a T5 at one point when I first did portrait sessions, this was like maybe 2014, 15. And I did, um, I did my cousin's like nursing um, classmates, a group photo. And I had a Canon T5 and I think just had like the nifty 50. If you guys remember the nifty, nifty 50, like a pancake lens. And then one of the one of the nursing students comes up to me. He's like, "Oh, I have the same camera body and set up." I'm like, "Cool!" <laughs> and you know, I'm, it was my one of my first paid gigs. I was like, "Cool, yeah, it's a great camera," <laughs> you know. So like, yeah. it doesn't ma it doesn't really matter because as long as you you know your camera and you're able to yeah. put out amazing images, that's that's all that matters, right? Yeah. Um, Oh, I also got really, I got really hooked on bokeh. By the way, bokeh. Oh yeah, got, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, you had had to have bokeh in order to to be a professional photo. That's I was stuck <laughs> on that for a minute. <laughs> who's who's that? Uh, who's that influencer on Instagram that was made that super popular? He did a lot of things with the string lights. Um, Brandon Wolfel. Brandon Wolfel, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. how kind of got. That's why I bought the Nifty Fifty because I was like, man, I want to get some photos like that. So I actually tried those photos. I'm like, it's not the same. Like he just, he just has an eye. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but one of the things I too kind of experienced is like when I started second shooting for other photographers is like, cause I had like, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. I, my go-to like my camera bodies was a Canon 5d Mark two. And at one point I had the, the one original 5d one and the uh, Mark two. So I would shoot for like other photographers and I would look at their camera bodies like, dang, she has a, she has a Mark IV. I'm like, dang, I wish I had that camera body. <laughs> she had like the, the, the EF 24 to 70 pro lens. I'm like, I'm shooting here with like a, a nifty 50 and a 24, one Oh five, you know? So sometimes I think with, with us, when photographers, we kind of get jealous when people have better gear. Um, especially if you're shooting for somebody else. Cause like, man, I wish I had that lens. But again, I don't want to harp it on too much, but it is what it is. It's like shoot with whatever you have and just make it work, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, they're all tools. And the more time you spend with a tool, the better you're going to be at using it. And yep. I, I'm definitely guilty of taking new gear to a wedding and trying to do all this stuff and then realizing in the in hindsight, I should have just stuck to my guns and not tried to overthink it and you know do what I'm what I know how to do already. Sometimes that's better than gear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ab absolutely. And I think over time, like, you guys probably can agree, it's like over over the time that you shoot, like, multiple weddings, you figure out what works for you and what lenses you prefer. And eventually, like, you don't need all these lenses, right? And I think that's maybe that's kind of why you, in my opinion, is you, Theo, and Nick, that's why you kind of shoot, like, with primes because you guys kind of prefer that look, right? Yeah, I prefer the the low light capabilities and the more blurred background. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's uh, low light capabilities. Uh, cost cost is uh, is and was a, a big one for me. And um, uh, yeah, I love I love that blurry background light. I can kind of kind of get a couple different looks. The the new prime or I'm um, sorry, the new zoom lenses uh that they're all putting out now are pretty much just as good before you know uh quality and sharpness of the prime lenses for the cost was you know it was it was something you know that was kind of unbeatable but now so these new zooms that they're you know canon sony nikon uh fuji they're all putting out uh they're they're amazing you can hardly tell the difference but i do like having that that room to to put out, give a client a light and airy look versus another one. If I'm doing like corporate headshots and stuff to have really sharp uh, photos with uh, everything's in focus and stuff like that. So. Right. Right. Abs absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, flash. Cause I think this is sometimes hard for people to understand if, you know, and again, I, 
I don't want to make enemies, but <laughs> there's some people that, oh, I can shoot everything natural light, right? Um, and that is not 100% correct because some situations you go into, it's like complete, complete darkness, right? There's no light and there's no ambient light. I mean, you can crank up your ISO to like as high as you can, but you're going to get a lot of grain um, for the most part. So one of, it's one of the essential things that if you're starting out is just get a basic speed light. And for the very for for a long time, I actually had I don't know if you guys remember the young young no, young no flash. They're like super cheap. They're like thirty thirty to forty dollars, yep. and they're just like manual. There's no TTL. There's no like you know like double A batteries. So super basic, but it works as long as you know how to use it. But now there's like you no, know, the flash out now is amazing. Like the Godox Godox V1. I think most of us use it. Um, just because of the lithium battery, the output's really good. It's a lot lighter too. And the way it's set up too, it's like the dome, right? You have the dome, which is super light compared to like Mad Mod, uh, Mag Mod, which use magnetics, but it's just it's just that sphere or even like the, the bounce. Um, it's all plastic. So it's, it's kind of heavy plastic. So it puts a lot of stress in your camera body. Um, but yeah, like, so let me ask you guys this in terms of like, the must have gear, right? You guys would agree that having a speed light or speed flash is important, right? Let's, let's start with Nick. Oh yeah. hundred uh, percent. Speed light, especially the Godox system, even young Nuo, uh, Westcott pro photo. They, they're all, you can trigger them all with remotes and wirelessly. So the studio flashes come in handy for a lot of stuff, but if, if a speed light is all you can get at the moment, you can you can do really amazing off camera flash stuff as well, and then to have a cam uh, flash on top of your camera is 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 pretty amazing. And yeah, uh, going back, you know, some of the things I also didn't you know pay uh, a lot of attention to is l really learning the light, you know, and how how you can make a photo look a certain way, uh, manipulating light and. Um, if you can use a speed light on top of your flash, bouncing it off of a wall and create some really amazing, uh, amazing photos and light uh, certain people uh, or uh, certain things the way you want it to, to be, you know, certain rooms the way you want it to be and stuff like that. So, yeah, 100 percent. How about you, Theo? Yeah, so I agree 100 percent. You definitely need a flash for those dark receptions, you know. But uh, I did used to live by the the uh, the belief that I could shoot everything natural light and just bump <laughs> up the ISO. Especially after I switched to Sony from Nikon, I I strictly shot everything natural light. Never used flash. Just lowered the shutter speed and bumped up ISO whenever possible. But uh, after shooting my first wedding, I quickly realized like flash is a must. <laughs> Because uh, even before my first wedding, I had a flash but never bothered to learn how to use it just because I was like, I never need it. Why would I need to learn how to use it? So on that first wedding day, I had the flash with me, but I just couldn't use it because I wasn't prepared. And oh, I didn't man. know how. Yeah. Oh, so I was man. panicking, had to get help <laughs> from the videographer. Like, oh, how, how do I use this, man? Like, I was struggling oh, that man. day. But uh, yeah, learning how to use a flash is, is definitely something you need to do. Oh, that's tough, bro. That's like, that's yeah. one of those like rookie moves. I, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a big, big learning day. But uh, <laughs> even then, you know, still made me fall in love with wedding photography. Absolutely. Yeah. What's up, Brent? Um, yeah, I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can raise the ISO or pull people outside. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, if you want to be able to t take good photos in any environment, you do need a flash. And for my style of shooting, um, yeah, multiple flashes usually. So, yeah, got to get oh, one. Yeah, Have it in uh, the bag. Yep, absolutely. As a backup. I, we just had a recent experience, me and Nick. So we shot at uh, in Palm Springs, what was it, Friday? Last Friday? Um, yeah. At a, at a Segura Hotel, which is like <clears throat> one of the most like, unique hotels in Palm Springs because of the architecture and then the colors. There's a lot of like bright colors that's painted on the walls inside the lobby. It's very, very cool. And so even though there's a lot of like white walls there too, I knew we're going to have to use flash. Um, usually when, 
when I have on camera flash, it's normally when I start doing like reception um, photos, just because I like to be mobile. Um, there are options too, like you can just have an assistant and like have an off camera flash. That's also cool. But if you're by yourself and you just want to be mobile, just having oh, I should have it with me, but having a a camera and a flash on top of your camera is like the perfect setup. But I'll grab one. <laughs> yeah, so Nick has one. Um, yeah, grab that V one. So. <clears throat> And let me just kind of stress why you need backups on backups because when we when we were setting up for like the family photos, I I decided to use the eighty two hundred. So it's Godox eighty two hundred, and just have two you know cr like cross lighting. And but I knew I wanted some fill light, so I <clears throat> I decided to grab the Godox V one to have it on top so I can have some light, some front light. And I I grabbed it and I'm like, there's something loose in my v1 and so i put the battery in it didn't turn on and i thought it was a battery so that's the v1 right there our <laughs> flash point and i thought it was a battery so i always bring actually <clears throat> perfect so it's a lithium battery so you can't put you know double a's but <clears throat> i always actually now always bring a charger with me as another backup so i thought it was a battery because I, I just had used it yesterday but nick knows i think we all know that the battery lasts for a long time and I only had a small wedding the day yeah. before. And so I plugged in the, the battery into the flash and then dude, it didn't work. It didn't turn on. I'm like, what the hell is happening here? So I did it again. It's not working. I plugged into the charger for like five minutes. It didn't work at all. So I was like, dude, I'm like, what am I going to do? Luckily, I know that I always carry a backup flash in my other bag. So I carried the TT 600 and saved my life. Because if I didn't have like on camera flash, like it will be, I mean, I could still get away with it, you know, having maybe Nick eight, with 8200 following me the entire time. But that's a perfect example why maybe you need two flashes. Because what happens if your, your one flash dies out? What are you going to do, right? Um, For those wondering what an 8200 is, it is an off camera flash strobe. And it has a removable head you can add this is the fresnel head it comes with a bare bulb head you can also get a round head just like the v1 yep. and this thing that's on it is the mag mod which mike was talking about and you get this thing called a mag grip it's mag magnets magnet and yep. then you get diffuser like that just go on like that and this is a 200 watt uh strobe yep perfect but yeah, that was uh, you just never know. Things can happen, and I've had you know I've had gear break on me before, and that's the reason why I always bring extra. So again, that's why we I we always you know promote that you as a, as a wedding photographer have two camera bodies just in case something happens to your one main camera, and then you can use the other one as a backup. Same thing with batteries, like batteries are a must because you just never know right it could be what i one thing i found out is like sometimes when it's really cold when i i don't know if it's the same thing with like um it doesn't really happen to me as much because here in california it's not super cold but like when i shot in colorado i i, I the battery tend tends to like die a, a lot quicker um so that's something to keep in mind too um but yeah just having that as backup and maybe bringing your charger right um just in case like you need to charge those extra batteries in case so um so like let me ask you nick in terms of like your backups um do you always bring everything with you or you kind of like minimize and like just bring what you need for that wedding day i try to minimize and then i always bring everything with me um <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah i i've for my wedding, I now have a dedicated kit that I bring. Uh, I know that if I have the room, I will be putting two, two 8200s up in the corners uh, for reception. And that's going to be, so I bring two light stands for those two uh, 8200s. I know that I will be using off-camera flash for my portraits. So I will bring, I might bring another stand depending on if I if I know the situation, if I know that I'm going to be able to set my reception stuff up uh, prior to the whole wedding itself, then I'll bring a third stand so I can 
have my uh, my portrait light ready to go and then my 200s are already set up and uh, I also I forgot to mention I also recently got a uh, the Flashpoint Explore 300 Pro which is pretty much my go-to now I don't bring I don't really bring I'll probably bring my 600 as a backup um, but I find that I really rarely do I need it even if if it's too bright I'll just bring the light a little closer in and then as far as like modifiers go um, for my 200s I'm using grids and they're the little I'll pull them out in a second they're the little uh, uh, mag mod grids and then I will uh, that's all I'm really putting on those and then on my 300 I usually have either a a large umbrella with me at all times. And then a, like a 25 inch, I use glow uh, from Adorama use glow, easy lock. I use the uh, one for the proprietary Godox mount. Um, And then as far as my cameras go, I always bring as many batteries as I can. I think I have uh, six right now and I'll I'll make sure they're all charged beforehand. And uh, I bring them all with me to the wedding and, with my cameras i have i do have the where is it i have the battery grips for my sony's and which house two batteries and it's usually by even a 10 a 10 hour wedding um typically i'll use one whole battery and maybe i'll have about 40 percent of the other battery left um but I, I still have backups just in case. Maybe I forgot to charge one of them or you never know the situ, you know, the situation with that. And then uh, with my, with my flashes, uh, I don't have any extra batteries just cause I recently got the, uh, the V ones. Yeah. And uh, well, I have, I have the flashpoint version, which is for anyone out there wondering flashpoint Godox, the same thing. Flashpoint again is the, uh, it's, it's the uh, Adorama version of godox they just have kind of a longer name the zoom uh lithium ion xr2 and then uh if you do if anybody gets into godox or flashpoint they will have a the mount like s for sony n for nikon c for canon etc uh i have the ones for sony and um yeah i i don't have any extra batteries they are they do take dedicated batteries i know the ones like mike was talking about the tt 600s or 685s those take uh uh there's a little slot on the side where you can actually put double a's so you can get rechargeable double a's or go to the store need be <laughs> and uh <laughs> get <laughs> yeah, and uh, just in case uh and grab some batteries and those those things are those things are pretty amazing flashes though. yeah exactly and, just really quick um i have a question from Outdoor Bro is a good friend of mine. Um, so it says, guys, what's your favorite focal length for talking head videos? So uh, in my opinion, I think a 24 or 35. If you're going to repurpose this for like Instagram, because if you're <clears throat> if you're shooting landscape orientation, right, it's wide enough as long as you're in like the middle of the frame and then you can crop it, <clears throat> you know, vertical ways. And, you know, make reels out of it, right? I think that's, like, the perfect type of focal length. But, again, I mean, I've seen people use, like, the 7200 for talking head videos just because you want that bokeh to be, be blurred out. Um, I mean, I think on the iPhones, they're technically, what, like, 32, 33 millimeter, I think, for, for, for the most part. So, and that's usually, like, that's that's most, like, for most, like I think, talking head videos, that's a good range for like wide, fo- wide focal lengths. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have any opinions on that. I mean, just yeah, haven't done any. Just so. depends on. Okay, good deal. Sorry. No, go ahead. That that was all. I was just saying, I haven't done any talking head videos, so depends on what kind you're doing, in my opinion, and what kind of room you have. <clears throat> if you are like vlogging, uh, a thirty-five probably won't be enough so 24 especially if you're you know if you're vlogging and you don't have you know you're just bringing your camera with you and you're holding it out like that a 35 you might make it if you're you know as long as but you know it's still from your length so i say a 24 millimeter uh also again depending on your on how how far away you're going to be holding your camera or if you have a tripod with you you 
what you plan to uh, use it for. Uh, but yeah, as far as, as far as that goes, um, I recommend uh, 24, 35, uh, 20 for 70, 16 to 35 for talking head videos. Um, and then also depending on the look you're trying to get. Exactly. Um, you could pretty much use anything, right? I mean, you can use a uh, GoPros for talking head videos. Um, Oh, yeah. Your iPhone, which I use a lot for just if I'm on the go, I just want to record something. You know, even the front facing camera is amazing. I mean, whatever you guys have, use. I think a lot of people get stuck on like, I want to provide the best quality image to my viewers. But sometimes the most convenient thing and the content that you put into the video, what matters most. Um, so, again, since we're talking in the realm of gear, it's like, it really doesn't matter unless, uh, as long as your content's amazing. Um, but I, I do want to share, <laughs> I want to share another story with you guys because I have a lot of interesting stories re regarding gear. Um, so this was like 2017, I believe. And I had an engagement session up in Big Bear Lake. And it was around like, I think it was around the, you know, it was getting cold. Uh, it was around October, I think, or November. It hadn't, you know, rained at all yet, but it was super cold up with Big Bear. So I think we we decided to go up there on a Friday um, just because, like, it's a little bit better than Saturday. You're not going to have as much traffic. And I think sunset was around 6 at the time or something like that. And so I always get there early, right? So I get there, like, an hour early, waiting for my couple. I have my trunk popped open, and I'm getting all my gear ready. Um, and then... And then my client arrives and, you know, he's getting ready, uh, him and his fiance. And we're just ch chatting it up. And then, like, I see in the rear, rear like, I, I see someone walking behind me. Like, and it looks like another photographer. She he has, like, the dual harness from, you know, Holdfast. And she's like, excuse me, excuse me. She's like, the sweetest voice. I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> and then she's, and she asked me, um, sorry to bother you, but do you have um, extra SD cards? And like, she has like a couple like waiting for her be right behind her. I'm like, yeah, sure. I always bring extra here. Take it. It was like, I had like a small 16 gig, I think. I was like, yeah, take it. You know, you can have this. Don't even worry about it. Like, and uh, again, I didn't, you know, I don't really think most of uh, much about it just because like, like I like helping people and it's just the way I do it. Like, I don't care. Like, don't even, don't even trip. Cause I know if you didn't have that SD card, I think she would have to drive all the way to the village, right? Which is like, because I was shooting at Juniper Point, which is on the North Shore. So you have to drive all the way around, which will take you 30 to 40 minutes. By the time she gets back, it's going to be, there's no more light. So I felt so bad for her, but I'm like, I, you know, in the back of my mind too, like you're a professional, like you should have like a bunch of backups, like in your backpack, just in case, like. So let me ask you guys this, because this is one of my most interesting stories. And I've learned a lot from when that happened to me. I've learned a lot because I always double check and triple check my gear for the most part. Sometimes I get out of hand and I may forget something. But <clears throat> have you guys had any like things where you forgot a certain like gear to bring on a photo shoot or anything like that? Let's start with Theo. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so... This one day I was second shooting for someone in, in LA. So it's about, it was about an hour and a half away from me. And uh, I got there, thought I was ready, thought I was confident. And I started setting up my gear with the videographer that was there. And l luckily for me, he shot Sony as well. But uh, as I was setting up, putting on the lenses and everything, I went to put memory cards into my camera, forgot all my memory cards so thankfully he shot sony so i was able i mean he had the same memory card so i was able to borrow some from him and uh also i packed my flash and i took my flash out for the reception and looked at it it's the godox v1 and the lithium ion battery was not in there and left that at home on the charger as well so it was just man it was a hectic day but thankfully shooting sony i was able to just shoot shoot all natural light baby you know, just bump up the ice. <laughs> oh man, yeah, so or, it was a hectic day. I mean, you can always go to like Rite Aid or Walgreens, and that's true. That's true. <laughs> but uh, 
<laughs> yeah, from that day on, now I'm like double checking gear. Sometimes I like second guess myself and I'll pull off like when I leave my house already, I'll just pull off to the side of the road and check my bags again just to make sure, you know. Oh my god. How about you, Brent? Did you uh, ever had an uh an event like that? Well, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one who <laughs> checks his stuff a few times and then as he's pulling out of the driveway, checks it again. Yeah. I definitely do that. I'll I'll get out of the car and I'll pop my my hatch, open up my bag and I'll be like, "I just checked this, but I'm going to look anyways." <laughs> um I actually always bring um my battery chargers for all my Godox stuff and for my cameras, just in case. Um, usually there's a plug and an outlet somewhere at the wedding events. So I always like to have that just in case. Um, in terms of forgetting something, the only thing I've ever forgotten is my, um, my hold fast strap, which doesn't seem like a big deal. Um, but when you want to carry two cameras all day, uh, it is. So <laughs> I was lucky enough that I also showed up super early to a wedding and I got to the, I got to the getting ready spot and got all my stuff out. And I'm like, Oh man, I don't have a harness to put these cameras on. And I didn't have neck straps either. So I was early enough to where I was able to drive back to where I was staying and get my strap. But, uh, in terms of forgetting something and having to manage without it, I haven't done that. Oh man. So the quadruple you... checking seems to be working. Yeah, that's that's a great tip, guys. Like, you know, pack up all your gear and then double check again once you pack it in your car, just in case, you know, you don't want to be an hour away and then have to drive back home. So um, how about you, Nick? Yeah, so same. I uh I I forgot. Sorry, my dog's going crazy. I actually forgot my, my dual camera harness and I got all the way to the venue and I was like, no, but if you saw me when I was showing my cameras earlier, I actually have these little guys on here, right here, which are peak design, uh, little clips for the peak design straps and gear. And a long time ago, I'd watched a photographer, uh, I think it was Manny Ortiz was talking to, mm -hmm. about that. And I was like, man, I wish that never happens to me. So I, bought into that system as kind of a backup and I threw one of the strap in one of the slots just in case I ever need it or in case sometimes if I go out for like traveling or something I don't need my my dual camera harness and I just so happen to have that and rock that for the day but yeah I forgot my dual camera harness and I, I was like how am I gonna do this day <laughs> you know I think I lied um I did forget the screw in um mm. hold fast tools once and i was shooting a wedding with mike and theo actually and he had an extra so i was oh good. that's right <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right oh, yeah. i think i'm not yeah but i'm not the only one i, I remember brent i forget mine and uh and i had to borrow yours just for like the that yeah. wedding so <laughs> but <laughs> um but i also had another one too where i think i shot for george and we were only up in lake arrowhead and like where is my um yeah, the little screw things for the hold fast. And like, how am I going to think? Luckily, George had extra. So he's again saved the day. But uh, again, just double check, triple check. Yeah, there you go, Nick. That Those are like the little screw um, hooks. And it's super, super like, you know, like amazing. Those things will not come off unless you start like twisting it. Then you may have an issue. But I've never had my cameras ever fall off. Um, from that unless like the actual hook from the harness you didn't like completely lock in and then you may have an issue um yeah. oh and for the people out there rock in the the little plastics that come in the uh when you buy your sd cards they do sell cases like this that you could throw in your bag oh, yeah and and will hold multiples and they're usually waterproof yep. and uh and even if you just have a couple in there, these things, lifesaver. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let's get into that. Let's get into, uh, like, what's, like, the, you know, must-have, like, little, like, accessory for wedding photographers you think that really just made your day, that kind of just changed the way you, uh, you know, shot weddings? Like, what's one thing you had to choose, like, you bought that really, like, just changed the game for you? Let's start with Theo. 
I was gonna say you should start with someone else. Um, <laughs> honestly, I can't think of anything right now. Um, I definitely think having camera straps is is nice because I didn't always have that, especially yeah. for my first wedding. I was just holding my camera the whole time or putting it down for a minute or two here and there when I could. But uh, definitely having a camera strap to hold your camera and any downtime you have because man, your forearms and your wrists are just working out the whole day for holding your camera. hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with you. Cause when I first started, I had, um, the peak design, I had the, like, like Nick, those, uh, you know, the peak design belt, like the seat belts. And those were great for one, I think for one camera body, but when you're trying to shoot with two bodies, like, you know, just having two straps on your shoulders, like gets tiring after, after like a long wedding day and just doesn't like, it moves around, you know. Um, so for me, when I bought the whole fast, it was a game changer. Like it just looks good, you know. It's you can buy. It. I mean, they have so many different colors, like type of straps. It it doesn't hurt my it, like the the way it sits on your shoulders and back really takes away from the lower back, in my opinion. Like my back, my lower back doesn't hurt as much. My shoulders hurt sometimes, but I'd rather have my shoulders hurt than my back. You know what I mean? Um, and it's just so useful because like when you bring that camera up, it comes right up to like here. It, it, it's hard to like do overhead shots. You may have to take it off, but <clears throat> it comes up right, right up to here. And like, it just, it's perfect. Cause once you're done with that camera, you can bring it down, grab the other one. So for me, that was a game changer. Yeah. How about you, how about you Brent? Um, I've got this one tool that I, I got. I learned from Erica and Lanny Mann from Two Man Studios. It's called a Manfrotto Nano Clamp. Oh. And it's this little clamp. It's about this big that you can screw a ball head onto. And then you can put your flash, you can mount your flash on this clamp. And this clamp can clip onto anything. It could clip onto a shower um, door or a mirror yeah, yeah. or a regular door. And you can tighten that down and have a flash in a, anywhere you need a flash that may be too small for a nightstand, like a, in a bathroom, uh, I said nightstand, a light stand. Um, <laughs> so like if you're shooting a bride in the bathroom or a groom in the bathroom and you want to, you know, do some creative lighting, sometimes bringing in a, a light stand with big old feet just doesn't work or it works and it sort of cramps everyone's style and you feel uncomfortable bringing a big light in. So this one little Nan, uh, Manfrotto nano clamp has been, a unique and um, clutch tool for me. Nice, nice. That's awesome. I, I think I've have I seen that. Have Probably, I always keep it in my bag. Yeah, I think I've seen it in your backpack. Um, that's very cool. How about you, uh, Nick? I got a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I that SD card case is one of them. Uh, it's a big one for me. Uh, my my uh, straps, which by the way I use, I use it for anyone out there. Uh, who looked at the hold fast and was like, what? Um, I use Quiro. It's C-O-I-R-O. They also make dual leather camera um, harness straps and um, they're, they're a lot, uh, a lot more affordable. Uh, and if you're just getting in there, you know, getting your first dual strap. Uh, but yeah, uh, camera bag, camera backpack, upgrading that bad boy and uh, getting something I could fit a lot of, a lot of gear in and uh out something outside of just a little camera bag and then recently came across i'm going to grab it to show you guys here, here um, we go i think this is what he's talking about right here um i think you buy on b and h choir here you go Nick. you can I'm find show them on it. etsy or their yeah. website quiro.com yeah. shop.com yeah hey guys before yeah. we move on i gotta jump out early i got a toddler i gotta tend to oh okay all right brent okay. thank you so all much right. man yeah, it's been nice Have talking to you guys. Bro. See you all soon. All right, appreciate it. Late. Bye. See ya. And then uh, as far as the other thing that I just came across recently, uh, I don't – I personally don't own any uh, C-stands, and um, but I really like the way – I've been utilizing beauty dishes a lot more, and I love the overhead look. And I recently came across this thing – which is by a company called Kupo. Yeah, Kupo, K-U-P-O. Um, I came across this guy, and this is a, um, it's called a Kupo uh, baby arm. 
and it oh, goes onto your light this. stand. Yeah, it goes onto your light stand just like this. Screw it down, and then you put your light right here. And in turn, you have a C stand if you just have a regular, you know, light stand with the uh, three lay, you know, three legs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. This this thing is um, has definitely changed uh, the game for me with portraits, headshots. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just messing with this, uh, <laughs> these layouts right here. You're good. I'm, I'm all going back in it. Like... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of like another thing that really changed the game for me. Um, when definitely I'd say the mag mod. So let me, uh, you know, oh, let yeah. me just pull up. Let me pull it up on. Uh... Yeah, I got. I got a bunch of them. Yeah, to show. you got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just... So let me let me put Nick on here. All right, so well, if you guys have 8200s, um, these are amazing. And I mean, you can use pretty much any flash unit that can. So let's start with like the, the actual magnet itself. So if you could show them right there, Nick, right on like the flash head. Yeah, and I'll take it off. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. You can explain it. Oh, OK. I was just going to be. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so here. So here's the uh, this is called the mag grip and it goes on there just like that. It's the little band. It goes on there and put it on there. Just kind of stretch it out. Hopefully everyone can see that in the camera. goes on there just like that. There's magnets right here and right here. And this right here, this this is the 8200. And if anybody's curious, this is just a, a rubber, uh, rubber deal I got to protect the 200. This is what the 200 looks like outside right. of that. And uh, so, yeah, this is mag mod and uh, this is the mag grip. And this is what you need in order to put any of the or to use their modifiers, such as I will start with the grid the grid. I was talking about the grid helps control, narrow down the light so you don't have so much spill and it goes on there. Well, if I get it right, just like that. So that's how their that's how their magnet system works, and uh, I use this for reception lighting because it'll still send out light, but I don't necessarily want light going all over the room. I kind of I kind of like a more moody, dramatic look when I do my stadium light or rim lights and stuff like that. So I usually fix this on top of a stand, uh, put it as high as the light stand goes, but around eight and a half nine feet kind of angle it down just ever so slightly and uh, usually have the power between between 164th on the as far as the Godox and um, Flashpoint stuff goes. You can also change. I've, I recently found out I upgraded all the firmware, by the way, you guys. You can change the way you see the layout. So if you want rather it look like something like Westcott or Profoto, you can change the way the stops work. So instead of seeing fractions, you can see power one through 10. Um, but, uh, and then they have like an extended mode. But anyways, going back to the magma, they have, there's, they have all sorts of stuff. They have grids, they have this guy, which is amazing. This is uh, called their mag sphere. And this, this actually does the opposite of this, which, it diffuses the light, kind of gets rid of the specular highlights, and then it spreads light everywhere. And I actually will use both of these in combination to create a more soft light, kind of bring down how much it goes around. So it'll it'll do a grid look with a softer softer light, and it works for like couple portraits and stuff like that, uh, different looks. I'll use this to do really wide photos uh, where I'm going to be eliminating the stand, the using a big soft box isn't as a big a deal. Um, but yeah, they have, they have all sorts of, they have one called the mag bounce, which uh, goes on there just like, just like that. And the uh, it's just, it looks like a, it's just a rubber bounce card uh, in, in, in a sense. So it goes on there like that, put it, put it out and it gives you a, a bounces the light. They also recently came out, they have, they have, uh, they have had, gels for a long time they recently came out with these new ones uh for like color correction or creative gels artistic gels uh these ones now have the magnets in them as well so you can just throw them on your flash like that you, and you'll have a gel 
gel uh, system going on. They have different colors, different correction gels that go on there. And, uh, and yeah, they have, uh, they now have soft boxes and you can get the mounts for those guys. And, uh, you would need what's called a mag shoe and a, uh, a mag ring. And instead of, instead of screwing it on or using a mount, it uses magnets and it just clicks on there. And yeah, uh, the soft boxes are all magnetic as well. And I personally no longer have those. I know Mike has has the is utilizing that now. They have a 24 inch uh, soft box uh, octa uh, to octa box, a 36 inch strip box, and a 42 inch octa box. And um, uh, for their for their new uh, pro line, and um, but yeah, that's that's a mag mod stuff and a crunch. Yep. Yeah, they're great. Um, again, I've used them for many years, and they're a little bit more on the pricey side. But again, I think with gear, it's something you have to think about long term. Like you know, a lot of the a lot of the the really good gear, like, and there is a you know a good good like gap between I think like consumer gear and pro gear. So when you step up to like pro gear, they, the quality and the make is a lot better and they'll typically last you many years more than like, you know, like cheaper gear. Right. Um, I mean, anything can work, but I think it's just the longevity of the gear. You'll see that it'll just, it'll last a lot longer. Um, yeah, for example, these magmod, these, yeah. sorry, Mike, these magmod yeah. things, like he's saying, um, you could like run them over with a car. Yeah, and they're just gonna come right back. That's another big selling point on them. These grids I've had for three years now, and I've had you can literally fold them up, put them in your pocket, and they're just gonna come right back. Yep. But yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, um, let's kind of talk about modifiers because uh, that because Nick touched on that. Um, like for example, the modifier that from Magmod, you know, the grid and then the sphere. But if you're starting out and you don't have a lot of money, um, and as long as you have a flash. You can do anything with that. So what I would recommend is just buy like a super cheap umbrella. Um, I don't know if you have any umbrellas in your uh, <laughs> in your uh, I, retail, I, I retail store, Nick. I was prepared. I, 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 <laughs> you said gear. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So like, how, how much is that umbrella, Nick? I got these off Amazon. A two pack for maybe $15, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah they're, pretty, and, they're pretty inexpensive. Yeah, which, where do I go? Okay. And yep. I think they're about 34 inches. Yep. Real simple. Super simple. And again, the whole point of modifying light is just so, like, if you want softer light, like the umbrella, you basically just have the light behind the umbrella, and it just basically makes the light bigger so and softer because the bigger the light comparison to your subject or your talent it's going to make it softer um of course also distance too but that that's a really good option if you're starting out you're trying to do portraits and that's how i started out i had i believe the young nuo um and luckily with the young nuo when you buy those you can buy like multiple oh we kind of lost nick here but you can buy you know two of those flashes Sorry about that. and you can trigger it can trigger the other flash, right? It's like a, a trigger and a transmitter at the same time. So I was just using like the actual flash from Young Noah to trigger the other flash and just having the other flash off camera and having good light on my subject. And that was like, that's like a $50 setup. Of course, you may need to buy like a bracket to hold the umbrella. Um, you know, that was probably like another $10 um, and a good, you know, a good stand. Um, it, depending on how heavy your, your flash is. But um, as long as you you have like a decent stand, most of the time, like it's not going to go anywhere unless you're shooting outdoors. And that's one, one thing <laughs> you have to keep in mind because I've, uh, I've had a few flashes fall on me before. Um, and, you know, Nick knows. Um, but <clears throat> even my, by myself, if you're shooting at the beach, that's probably not a good idea if you're going to use umbrella. Just use, yep. just probably use the basic flash and maybe like a a, a grid or a, like a sphere on there. I think back yep. in the day, you guys ever heard of the Gary Fong? Yep. You guys heard of that one? Now, let me pull it up. I don't think I have. Oh, you haven't? Oh, man. 
He's, it looks kind of like the mag sphere. I, I think that's um, I think Magmod copied Gary Fong, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, big time. For, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Right, let me. Sh- let me show as far you as I go, as far as like going to the beach, for the most part, you, when you're when you're going, you're gonna get tight shots as well for sure. But when you're going to the beach, yeah. you're kind of getting the whole scene. And I've found for me, if I'm using flash, and it's usually almost always windy at the beach. I've I've found that, um, and this is this is from watching guys uh, like from T and K, uh, Michael Anthony, uh, you know these guys shoot direct flash. I don't even, sometimes I don't even use modifiers. They'll just point the flash right at their couples. And especially if it's even a harsher light day, you know, if you, yeah. if you're using a harsh light source with harsh light, you know, sun, it's going to look more natural. And if you have a real wide photo capturing the whole thing, it's going to, it's just going to look so epic and just, yeah, even just bare flash. Yeah. That's a good tip actually. Um, because if you're if you're flash, let's say you're doing white photos, most of the time it's not even gonna matter if you put anything on it because, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna matter. It's still gonna look good. Like you just need light on the subject because you're so far away. Like you're not gonna worry about specular highlights on their face. I mean, it's not really gonna matter. So, but unless you're doing like beauty shots or really close up photos, it may be too harsh to just do bare flash. Um, yeah. But again, all you need is something to like any white cloth. You could just use like a freaking, you know, like a bed sheet, bed sheet. Yeah. yeah, or a pillow, and you can make it work, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, let's let's kind of move on to uh, let's move on to oh, we lose no, Nick here. Sorry, <laughs> I keep getting phone calls. I'm using my. Phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good. Uh, we're probably going to talk about a couple more topics here, but we'll uh, we'll. We're almost done here, but let's talk about, um, in terms of like, like if you had to, let's say, cause we, we talk about this a lot, right? So a lot of people want to switch brands. So from Sony to Canon and because we see it all the time, people sell their stuff on offer up or Facebook marketplace. What's, what's your advice if someone wanted to switch to a completely new system, let's say someone has a Canon and he has the Canon lenses and they want to switch all over to Sony. Like what's you guys thoughts about that? And what's your opinions if someone wanted to switch? So let's start with Nick. And be ready for a, a really big process. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely do your, do your research. Do you, if you wanting to do this, make the switch, do your research again, I recommend running, running gear. Uh, I was just telling Mike the other day, we were talking about different places to rent. He was talking about IE photo rentals. There's also lensrentals.com. There's all sorts of stuff uh, where you can rent gear. Uh, really look into that, you know, decide if that's really the right choice to make. Um, as far as camera gear goes these days, Canon versus Sony versus Nikon um, versus Fuji, all this different stuff. Uh, full frame versus crop sensor versus medium format, et cetera, et cetera. The, to be honest, they all put out amazing photos and it's look into what feels good for you. You know, that's why I was saying rent gear, look, you know, what, what feels good for you? What, what makes you want to go out there and shoot? Um, don't just upgrade or yeah, don't just upgrade or go switching just because your favorite YouTuber or influencer uses a certain brand or a certain uh, type of camera there. They put nowadays, if you put up, you know, certain, it, you use a white card and you put up, uh, you know, th- from Sony Nikon and Canon, it's going to be pretty hard to even tell a difference if that's something that's important to you. Uh, as far as, you know, the cameras go, what do you do? What kind of, are you doing corporate headshots? Are you doing fashion? Are you doing wedding? You know, how many megapixels do you have? Uh, or, I mean, I'm sorry, how many megapixels do you need on your camera? Are you working for a studio and they require something like that? So as far as, again, just do the research. It's uh, it's quite a tedious process switching over. I, I also had Canon 
back uh, a long time ago, I actually had some Nikon um, SLR uh, film cameras and went to Canon and it wasn't that big a deal back then. Uh, but then I went to Sony and had to sell everything and started over, over new. I didn't realize that a lot of the uh, lenses you can actually buy adapters for, even for Canon uh, EF lenses you can use with Sony bodies. You can get an adapter for that. Uh, a lot of cameras you can buy adapters for. So look into that as well, but it's quite a process. You know, how, how invested are you into it? Are you, do you have just a camera body in one lens? Is it going to be pretty seamless or are you like me where I have uh, Sony's multiple camera, uh, I'm sorry, multiple lenses. I have these, this V1, which has a Sony mount, which uh, shout out to the new to the new uh, metal mount that Godox put out. I recently upgraded my my V1, so now they're metal. Uh, Theo, by the way, um, <laughs> yeah, they're uh, super sweet. But uh, and they go on a lot easier, by the way. Just I'm all again Theo. Uh, you know how they usually, you know, really hard to get on and off for the Sony. Yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, how how invested are you? Do you have flashes and and flash triggers such as such as this trigger that goes on that will trigger all the flashes? Are they do they all have mounts on them? Are you using you know all Sony stuff? Uh, and now you're gonna have to buy into new flash, uh, new speed lights, new triggers, stuff like that. So it could be it could be quite hard. But if you do go about it, you know there's different uh, avenues such as offer up. You can look into uh, Facebook Marketplace to sell your sell your gear, and um, uh, I think B and H, I think Adorama does it, and then K E H Camera. You can sell, you can get quotes and sell your sell your used gear as well, and get uh, get them all, you know, and also buy used gear. That's a like, like we said earlier, get used gear that's like from companies like that, uh, K E H, Adorama, B and H, uh, all these all these uh, places that, that have like refurb, I uh, can't think of the, what is it? Uh, certified, certified mm -hmm. like refurbished gear, stuff that they've really gone through and cleaned up. That's a, another good one. Exactly. What's your thoughts on that, Theo? Yeah, I think Nick covered most of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so definitely just do your research, you know, know what you're getting into because it's not, it's not as easy as getting a new iPhone or switching laptops or something you know you're switching an entire ecosystem whether that's like nick said you're switching all your flashes your lenses your camera bodies everything like that even like camera batteries you'll need to buy more of those for your new yeah. camera you know like it's a it's a lengthy lengthy process but uh you know another thing is just make sure you're switching for the right reasons you know uh i used to shoot on nikon and when i switched I don't regret switching, but when I switched, the only reason I switched from Nikon to so Sony was because of the hype Sony was getting with the mirrorless yeah. cameras and because of the hate Nikon was getting. You know, that's that's the only reason I switched at the time. I don't regret it, but um, yeah, just know you it, just make sure you're switching for the right reasons. But yeah, you are it, happy that your clients' uh, eyes aren't focused now, right? <laughs> I'm just playing anybody out there. I'm just playing. You know, maybe that's, before, truthfully, that, you know. That's actually started... some of the that's some of like the biggest hype I ever heard. And that's like it kept me away from Nikon. And I actually shot with somebody who had a Nikon and I used it and I, I freaking loved it. I thought it was amazing. The color output, like right out of the RAWs, the way the camera fell. I love the little dedicated ISO button you press or ISO, depending on you know. Um, you press and then you just spin the wheel like I I think it's a pretty great camera and I stayed away from it because a lot of these YouTubers I'd watch are like the focus the autofocus isn't as good, right? And like today I very seldom am I actually using all autofocus if I'm not just if I'm not using a point or something like that. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Nikon, you know, I do still miss it from time to time because I think the ergonomics of Nikon cameras just works way better than Sony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th those are great points. Um, like every camera brand has, I think, positives and negatives, you know, because I've used Sony, I've used Nikon as well. I've used Lumix. I mean, I don't know if I can find, I can't remember the exact 
when I was in Japan, I bought my very first Lumix camera. It was like super cheap, the point and shoot. And I had, I think it had like a zoom lens on it. Um, and so, yeah, but, but yeah, like Theo and Nick are right. Like when you guys are thinking about switching brands, it's like a whole ecosystem. Like you have to think about everything else that you need to buy, not just the camera and the lenses, but the batteries, the, the type of SD cards, right? Because some, um, like, if you look at, like, Canon, a lot of the Canon cameras, like the Pro cameras, uses, like, the R5, the R3, uses a CF Express type B cards. So if you're used to buying the, as like, just regular SD cards, and you're going to have to probably invest in one of those. And those are super expensive. I mean, for, like, a 128, you're looking at, like, over $200 sometimes. Um, okay. And then the flash units, the... And, you know, and if you do video, you may have to like look into, you know, things that are in the post editing process, right? Like the LUTs, the stuff like that. So, but yeah, really think about that if you guys are thinking about switching, um, because it's like a big investment, especially if you, I think you are already established business and you are wanting to switch everything. Like think about also like having a backup right if you're trying to sell it as used gear like what happens if like you sell one lens and then somebody hits you up and like oh i want to do a photo shoot the next week and you don't have that lens that, that that comes in so you know there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind i think it's just hard for people that are already established i think to switch over than someone that's just starting out if you're starting out i think that's pretty easy but it, like i'm just thinking about myself if i had to switch oh my god like i would have to literally make a list of all everything I need to, to buy if I wanted to switch yeah. to like Nikon or something. Cause plus, a lot of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, plus like going, going off of what you're saying, Mike, uh, that's why I would say rent because say you do make that switch and you made your whole business, you know, revolving around your Sony or your Canon, and then you switch to Sony or Canon or Nikon or Fuji, um, especially Fuji, uh, depending on what kind kind you get like if you get the xt models with the all you know manual dials up mm -hmm. top uh learn that camera you know uh say you made your whole living off of doing wedding photography with a sony a7 III like myself and then you switch to the canon the canon r5 or the r6 luckily i've i've been able to work with mike and i've, I've used those cameras so i have a good idea but if i just hopped in there and then try to do like an engagement next weekend i my I, I don't even know like i'm sure my quality would turn out well i know how to use the exposure triangle but say something happens on the camera and i i would be sitting there fiddling around for a while now you're having to learn a whole not, a whole new camera and uh and then uh also going like what theo is saying as far as like uh, oh theo and mike about like the sd cards and cf express cards for those who do use sd cards we were talking about these cards earlier by the way i just pulled that out so you guys can see that i don't know if it's coming out but um anyways those are the uh 128 uh, uh sd card extreme pros by sandis but yeah you're gonna you have to learn the camera <laughs> you'll be learning it all over again hey, exactly um so let's kind of talk about like um education because i think a lot of people want to uh learn a little bit more of like how we like learned our skills and did we learn it from like another photographer Did we learn from YouTube or, you know, what, <clears throat> what resource did we use? So I kind of, I'll start with myself. I think it'll just be easier for me to explain. Um, so for, with me, I was a big YouTube, like I've had YouTube, like I have my, I've had YouTube channels for a very long time myself. So I've always been into YouTube. So um, one of the like biggest inspirations for me was like, and you know this, Nick, like Pi Jerza, I've watched them for years. Um, you know, B&H has good resources on, on their channel. So there's a lot of free resources on YouTube. Um, there's even a lot of seminars that a lot of people post up on YouTube that you can learn. But the caveat to that is, I think, is that because I had a conversation on Instagram with another photographer. It's like you can learn. I mean, you can watch so much YouTube videos, but actually doing it live and in person when you're getting paid for it it's totally different right when you try and direct someone to pose while you're trying to fiddle with your camera it's it's so much different um so practice 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 with your gear 
Um, and you know, every chance you have, like when I first started, like, that's all I did. I, I shot everything and every day for like a whole year. Like I would go out, ask my family and friends to like, can I, can I have you just pose really quick? They got tired of it. Cause I would always bring my camera. Um, but, but yeah, that's one way to get better is just to practice on like your closest family and friends. Um, I actually never took like a course until like until recently i've been taking some courses recently but those are great too right um so let's start with theo um so how, how did you like learn theo in terms of like your skills now like where did you get most of your information from yeah so similar to you i watched probably hundreds of hours at this point of youtube videos you know learning everything about photography how to use the cameras the exposure triangle all that stuff was majority of it was from youtube even like how to edit photos the post processing you know best way to organize photos or something i even learned on youtube and then um <laughs> like i think for majority of the editing that i do though and my style that i developed was through um watching people edit photos live on live streams and stuff, you know, and I also live streamed my edits and I would just get input from different photographers here and there. And they would teach me like tips and tricks and Lightroom and Photoshop, you know, so just YouTube and learning from other photographers while live streaming my editing process, you know, was huge for me. And then as far as getting to know weddings better and learning how to actually shoot a wedding and run the day, like, second shooting and assisting other photographers and shooting for studios, you know, was a huge step for me. And I, I learned so much just from shooting with other photographers. Great. That's awesome, man. Yeah. How about you, Nick? Yeah. As far as I go, trial and error. Uh, I had some people in my life that shot photos as well um, on film cameras and I've always had a film camera and when I got started getting more into it, I YouTube as well, a lot of YouTube and uh, learned from other, other photographers. And the big turning point for me in my work was I found uh, an app called Udemy and I found a class on there called the Photography Master Class and where I received my uh, full certification and everything. And it's all online, kind of go about uh, you know, at your own pace, their video and the, they go over everything. Uh, the guys on there, I have them all on Instagram. I've, I've actually done some lives with them and uh, I've talked with them and they're, they're wonderful. They're uh, it's Phil, Phil Ebener, William Carnahan and Sam Shimzu Jones. Uh, check them out on Instagram. They're on my Instagram. If you look it up. Um, my following they're uh, they're absolutely amazing they're always willing to help and uh, yeah their class is really amazing it's real affordable and um, go, they go over everything from the beginning of exposure triangle and at the very end they even go over things how to start a business uh, different avenues how to use lightroom how to use photoshop how to use like stuff like snapseed if you're not ready for that uh, uh, how to edit on there how what prints to you know if you're interested in making prints and like um photo delivery and stuff like that they go over all that stuff flash everything it's a uh, it's a really great one and yeah uh still even to this day youtube uh getting out there as much as i can like my like you were saying uh photographing everyone i can and um i have my daughter i'll, I'll photograph her as much as i can and um even like, again, to this day, I will grab one of my modifiers and experiment, you know, experiment with different lighting. Um, even if I don't have anybody, I'll just use like a mannequin or something. And uh, yeah, trial and error, awesome. YouTube and yeah, yep. that class. Yeah, th those are great. I think whatever resource you have available to you, just learn as much as you can. And, and learning doesn't stop. In my opinion, I think we all mm -hmm. can agree on that. Is because new gear comes out, new techniques comes out, and uh, I've learned it, so much from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there you go. And you know, like, you. Yeah, yeah, like we learn from each other all the time, like about different techniques, and you know, and it's just, and I think the 
the biggest thing too, I think you could take away from this um, live is that it's like, be humble, right? Cause you're not going to learn everything right away. It takes time right. and you know, it could take years for you to learn like how to even really like be comfortable and pose like a couple. Cause I think a lot of people have struggles with that. Sometimes if you're like an introvert and you're just not like super like, you know, like spoken and you may have difficulty like trying to direct people and maybe that's not your forte and maybe it's just more candid style. Um, but being able to practice, like, that's why I said, that's why I said earlier, like practice with your family. Cause that's like the easiest, you know, you're comfortable with your family, you know, ask like maybe like, like one of your, your, your cousins to like do a family shoot. Cause on a wedding day, you're going to do family photos regardless. You're always going to do families. So having that experience to practice on your family, it's, it's amazing. Because, I, I mean, even today, every wedding I, I, I go to, there's always something I learn. Something that I never realized I, I should have done this, should have done this. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, take take it every day like a learning experience. Every time you go to a session and then just improve upon that, right? So improve upon every time you go to a session. How can you make things better? Um, whether it's gear, whether it's like your process, whether it's your communication with the client, whatever it may be, just continue to improve and learn every single time. So, so it comes to my last question to you guys. It's like, um, if you had to give like three tips to new photographers that are starting out and once again to wedding photography, what would be those three tips that you would give them that would go a long way in their career especially if they want to go <clears throat> full time and quit their job or even maybe just like do it as a side gig. But, um, you know, someone that really wants to do more weddings, like, um, so let's start with Nick. So what's your three tips you would give a new photographer, a new wedding photographer? I would say watch a lot of YouTube and look for any resources for, uh, uh, for like classes, like I was saying, like uh, Udemy is a great, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think of the other, the other app. Um, uh, oh my gosh, masterclass. It's like, masterclass. they're like master classes. Oh. Um, so I would say YouTube masterclass, uh, Udemy, uh, for business look really, mm. I was saying this last, last slide we did, um, really look into bit how to run a business. Um, uh, even if it doesn't really pertain to wedding photography, it will, you're running a business, it's a business. So uh, that look into business classes and maybe talk to people who are business owners, if you can. Um, uh, resource, most number two would be go out, uh, you know, resources that you can look up some uh, local wedding photographers, other photographers that are business owners that do this full time, such as, you know, uh, Mike, uh, myself, you know, Theo, uh, contact us, contact them, whoever is local in your area, you know, ask, ask questions and, um, definitely try to, try to work with them, try to second shoot and assist. And as far as gear goes, I would say rent, rent the gear and really, 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 really learn the, the gear first. And so, you know, uh, you're not out there stumbling like I said I was, and um, I did actually. Uh, when I when I did my first wedding, I had a situation. I think I put my, I think I had a button set for my camera to be on um, uh, uh, the dr uh, the drive mode button. I hit the drive mode button and I put it into like a 10 second timer, and I could not figure out <laughs> how to get back in. You know how to how to fix that. So uh definitely learn learn your gear awesome those are great tips all right Thea, what's your three tips you have to give to a new wedding photographer yeah so three tips so the first i would say is to shoot as much as possible get comfortable with your gear like nick was saying and just really know shoot in as many different situations as possible as often as you can you know even if it's um it might seem difficult, you know, you never know what you'll face on a wedding day and you always want to be prepared for situations, you know, for anything that could arise. So just shoot as much as possible, get friends, get family, set up styled shoots even that could be like mock engagement sessions, you know, 
just get comfortable doing all of that. And then secondly, I would say like second shoot, you know, reach out to photographers in your area, wedding, other wedding photographers, uh, either assist them or second shoot and learn how they run the day. Because I think for me, I definitely learned a lot after second shooting for my first time. It was eye opening because my first wedding that I shot was so hectic, so unplanned. I was so unprepared. You know, I was excited going into it. I still had fun. I learned a lot the day of, but I wish I was more prepared. And now I feel like I am just because of the experience I have shooting with other wedding photographers. And lastly, like a huge tip and a huge suggestion I wish another photographer gave me or someone said in YouTube videos is get really, really comfortable meeting people, meeting couples, you know, making conversation, even if it's small talk, because when you make conversation, you meet people, you make genuine connections. It just makes the whole day easier. They feel less awkward in front of the camera. You'll feel less awkward, you know, when you have to go and pose them. Cause I know for me, it feels, um, it's out of my comfort zone to be in control and to lead people. So I really have to get comfortable and to do that, making them comfortable just, you know, is an easy step to take. So yeah, just learn to get comfortable, get your clients and everyone around you comfortable and learn to really control the situation. Awesome. Those are all great tips, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I think the next um, live we'll do, I think that, it'd be a great way to tie in, like um, just talk about how we capture the wedding day. I think that's like super, super useful for a lot of photographers to really understand, like, you know, like all the little details. I mean, we, we probably can't talk about every single thing. It'll probably take like the whole day to talk about like every type of wedding. Um, but, but yeah, I think that'll be a great topic for our next video. Um, but again, I want to thank both of you guys. Also Brent, who's uh had to step out because of his is a uh, crazy kid no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> you know really really quick mikey uh, uh, sorry to cut you off yeah. before we end things i just want to yeah. ask you guys you know since the the wedding top uh, the topic for this this video was wedding photography gear have you guys ever broken gear on a shoot oh yeah yeah uh, unfortunately the one i remember very vividly was when me and nick when i had nick uh second shoot for me or assist me and uh let me pull up the flash really quick because we still have some time so this is <laughs> while you're eight. doing that you know i'm glad you mentioned earlier nick the the new godox mounts i actually yeah. broke broke mine recently and i have to order one to replace yeah. it but man like it's so the old mounts are so flimsy and so like unreliable it feels like yeah um yeah and have you ever changed the the mount by any chance no not yet i just i just ordered it recently yeah okay yeah it's super super easy there's four screws right here you unscrew them uh the little phillips pull you don't don't just yank it off i'm sure you probably watched some videos but you just kind of like take it off a little bit there's a little wire you just pull it out take the new one pull it push it in put it on there and it's good to go oh, nice cool Yep. Sounds simple enough. Awesome. Yeah. So, so really quick before we uh, log off here. So this is uh, the Godox or it's also Flashpoint, depending on where you buy it from, the 8600, which is a powerful flash, 600 watt per second. And um, so we, we had a wedding somewhere in San Diego and uh, it was kind of a windy day. It was a little bit, it wasn't super windy, but it, it, there was some wind. And um, so this, this flash right here is pretty heavy. So most of the time, if we put like a modifier on it, it'll stay pretty, pretty solid. Like it won't move any anywhere. But I think unfortunately when Nick had like, uh, had moved it all the way to the top, it was like to the max of that, that stand. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like on its toes in a way. So even a little bit of wind, like tipped it over. So it tipped it over like to the going back and it hit the back, it hit the back of the actual battery and at, I don't think it was Nick's fault. It was just a win too. And I've actually had that this thing fall two times already. So, yeah. but I'm telling you now though that this thing is a beast. Like it's it's fallen fallen on me like mo multiple times mm -hmm. on separate occasions, and it still worked. But this last the last time it broke, it was just because it's probably just straight on it hit was, the battery, yeah, and it, was it just. The yeah, it was the ender. It just hit so super hard, and so that is one of the situations where I had it just completely broke on me 
luckily we had you know 8200s but long story short you know watch watch what watch your light stands if you do put a big modifier on it so yeah, yeah that was like one of the, the situations yeah the, uh, check it out dude <clears throat> we put put this put this light stand up with a modifier on there um i think it was the beauty dish the glow beauty dish um but we threw it up and kind of kind of feathering the light up um they were standing in the shade beat in front of a hedge and the way this venue or the like the ceremony area worked it was this tiny little brick walkway and then there was grass everywhere right and we were doing the the family photos and stuff like that they were looking for their uh, the dad uh, i think it was dad of the groom and this guy just kept taking off everywhere <laughs> and <laughs> And they were like, where's the dad? Where's the dad? And uh, we, we were asking someone to find him. So I stepped off and mind you, this, this place was about as still and as calm as, as it got. As soon as I came back out, found the dad inside the, uh, inside the venue, came out. Uh, I must've ran in for just like probably 30 seconds, maybe a minute, come running back out. And it was windy. <laughs> it wasn't windy like the <laughs> whole time. It was windy and the light had fell perfectly on the brick little tiny wow. road that everyone yeah. walks down and we were over here but because it was so far up it fell down back and it it smacked and yeah just the, the, the little panel and everything shattered and yeah it was, Dang, it was a, man. what yeah, are the was, chances yeah it was really it's, sad <laughs> yeah so yeah one of the lessons learned like now we you know keep an eye on that and also too you know if you do put light stuff light stands up be careful because it could fall and hit somebody you know and can injure yeah. somebody so be careful where you put that but uh but yeah like i definitely want to do another um video about like you know like our you know experiences on like things that can happen right on a wedding day i think we'll we'll definitely set something up but but again i want to thank you guys so much um before we take off i want to have you guys share your like your website again one more time your instagram handle so people can find you and we'll post it on the description uh, down below so they can you know if they want to reach out to you they can they can so so would uh so would nick so uh my instagram handle should be right here somewhere right there <laughs> uh it's <laughs> at it's at uh photo g nicholas uh, and my uh, website same thing uh, photognicholas.com that's where you can find me and on facebook it's nicholas satarsky photography and if you need help spelling that it's on my instagram and my website <laughs> awesome thanks thanks nick how about you theo yeah so for me you could find me on instagram and facebook at theotran photos and then my website is just theotran.com Awesome. Awesome, man. Again, we're all wedding photographers here. So if you guys are in the, you know, the realm of looking for awesome SoCal wedding photographers, we travel everywhere. Um, so feel free to contact us. Um, again, if you guys like this content, subscribe to uh, Photos by Mikey YouTube because we'll put we'll be putting out more content for especially for you guys that want to learn wedding photography. I think it'd be a great resource for you guys to learn and follow. So, okay, guys, thank you guys again so much. Thank you to Brent. Maybe he's still watching us. So <laughs> I thank appreciate you, Mike. it. Okay, thank guys, you, I'll see you guys on the next one. All right. See you guys. Adios. All right. Peace.